All right, so uh, am, I, am I good for the volume? Yep, you guys can hear me. All right. I'm a loud speaker, but this is for the recording. All right, so yeah, I'm not sure how these seminars are usually. Uh, uh, people take totally cooked work or, or work that's in progress, but this is very much kind of work in progress. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I am eager to uh, get your reaction and uh, get some feedback. This is joint work with Jeff Negria, who is sitting in the front here as a student at University of Toronto, and also Guintare, or as everyone will know here, know her, Carolina. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll jump into it. But you know, if you if you uh, uh, if you if if you are at the latest NeurIPS, then there you will have seen that there are two sort of best papers. One of those best papers was actually a best new direction, and it was worked by Vaishnav Nagarajan and. Diego Coulter pointing out some issues with obtaining classes that, uh, classes that contain a learning classifier that for which there is a tight uniform bound on generalization error. So this work is was sort of inspired by that. I saw that work maybe the day after it showed up on archive, and, and, and it made us start thinking. And the main reason it made us start thinking was that we are, uh, uh, you know, I, I have a line of work with uh, Carolina uh, trying to get non vacuous bounds, and this was a potential obstruction to that. Program. Um, our our work our work had mostly worked with uh, randomized kind of modifications of the classifier, which sidestep this obstruction. But like we were ultimately interested in obtaining bounds for the actual classifier learned by these algorithms. And so seeing seeing this obstruction uh, made plain was very interesting. And so I got us thinking about how to get around it. So this is this is discussion of that. All right. So I was uh, expecting a, a, a varied Crowd, I'm not sure. Is there who who is not in the machine learning um, kind of pr uh, year here? I know there's a f some theory people. Um, all right, so just just a are you are you in, are you in theory or in math? Uh, a PhD student at this session was like machine learning. Okay, okay. So you know, basically, maybe I don't need this primer, but at the very least, I'll set some notation. Also, I'll go through it. Um, theoreticians are always very quick, so so. Um, all right, so machine learning primers. We have some training data, and I'm going to think about supervised learning here. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be given training examples, pairs of x and y's. x are the inputs. My job is to predict the output, the response, or label y. We're going to think about classification here, so think about 0 and 1 for the y. Uh, so we feed this data into our learning algorithm, which takes this data set and spits out a, a, um, a, an element in the function space x to y. Right? So this is going to be, going to be our classifier. We're going to learn a, a map from inputs to outputs. We're learning a function. Um, and so, one, 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 so one, if I combine my training data with this algorithm, then I get this learned hypothesis, which is a, a, a random variable in this function space. All right? And it's a random variable because the data are assumed to be random as well. Uh, so one thing I might care about is how well did I do on the training data? So I can count the fraction, or I can compute the fraction of mistakes, how many mistakes I made over the number of training data n. And that we call the empirical risk or training error. Class, training classification error, various things. I'm, I'm going to just, I'm, I've gotten used to calling this empirical risk. It's more of a statistical term than a machine learning one. Um, and uh, indeed, like this empirical risk can even maybe suggest algorithms you might use, right? I can, I can search over um, a class, a, a subset of all, a subset of all functions, so define some class, some, um, some uh, subset of this function space x and y, and I can search over that class choosing choosing, say, among those that achieve the minimal number of mistakes. That's empirical risk minimization. Um, so now, if all we, we don't only care about empirical risk, we care about how well this, this uh, procedure is going to perform on, on something else. And what that, is, what that something else is is, well, tomorrow I'm going to receive some new unlabeled data, S prime. And I want my empirical risk in the future. So. Uh, here, the empirical risk was for s. Here, I have s prime, this new data set. I want this one to be small as well. Right? So that's about generalization. Uh, now, we have no hope of doing this with no assumptions. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adopt a very strong assumption, but a, a typical one, and one that we're even sort of uh, stymied by um, still, which is I'm going to assume that both these data sets are, I, are IID draws from some common unknown distribution. And then, and then it makes sense to. Um, 
you know, I don't, I don't really care about the particular number here. I maybe care about, and it's full randomness, but maybe I care about my expected performance in the future. So I'll reduce, I'll reduce this empirical risk for future data down to its, its mean. So this is the, this is, my, this is the, and, and this can be simplified to the probability that uh, I'm going to make a mistake um, on average given my next, next set, next data. All right, so this is a machine learning primer. So I'm interested, I'm, uh, I, might, I might minimize the empirical risk, but I'm ultimately interested in this risk. All right, so this is a classic generalization story, uh, uh, which is sort of being, seeing some upheaval now. So um, actually going back one slide, I'm performing empirical risk minimization over some class H. And it's broadly, un, broadly kind of, you know, the, the, the t traditional story is that there's some kind of trade-off with how rich that class is and what, my, what I can expect the performance of my learning algorithm to be. So if, if, if H is a simple class, then I'm not going to fit the data too well because I'm too constrained. But also, my empirical risk is not going to be too different from what, I, what my risk will turn out to be in the future, or if I have some held out data. Um, if I uh, consider a much larger class H, um, increasing the kind of, uh, I'm being a little vague about complexity, but if I increase the complexity of my class, then I expect my training error to drop. It's going to decrease monotonically in this notion of complexity. But at some point, I might expect to start overfitting because uh, I, just, I, I, have, I have too much flexibility in choosing among empirical risk minimizers, unless there's some additional principle I can bring to bear, like how I, I, I can fit any data you could hand to me. So how can I possibly uh, continue to learn? All right, so this, this uh, I forget what color this is, maybe blue. This line is a training error or empirical risk is just going down. At some point, we kind of expect this kind of curve to flatten out and increase back up. This is my risk. And this gap is the generalization error. And that's, some, that's a quantity I'm very interested in characterizing for various learning algorithms. All right. All right, so, the, the, uh, so this, is, this is maybe the curve that you might expect if you're doing uh, traditional bias variance trade off in your, in your um, uh, 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 and studying algorithms in their traditional regimes. Uh, but you find this sort of curve um, in deep learning, and so this is a big mystery. So, so here is a neural network. I'm, inc I'm increasing a notion of complexity again. So this is the size of neural network that I'm fitting. Uh, and these networks are being trained in, in a usual way using stochastic gradient descent. And this is, this is a plot from, um, from Nesha Burr and colleagues when they were at TTI. Uh, so I'm seeing, as I would expect, my training error sort of going down, down, down. At some point, it actually hits zero. I'm make, no longer making mistakes in the training data. But rather than the, uh, the, the risk of my classifier at some point leveling off and creeping back up as I use too complex of a neural network, it kind of levels off. And so explaining this plot is big business now, and there's lots of theories. I think this is error, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you hit literal zero, and you're no longer making mistakes on the training, training set, uh, and you're, 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 you're this, and this is of course an estimate of your risk. You have some held out data, and so this means that your your performance on this held out data, which is not being used by the learning algorithm, is settling down. So that's kind of, it's, a, it's, it's something a mystery, and like you know, the the main kind of idea is that well, okay, there's some additional inductive principle at bear, um, at at uh, at, uh, at work here, and you know, there's potentially a kind of a, a continuum, or at least a huge dimensional, uh, in terms of dimension, huge space of possible ERMs that I can choose among. How am I, how, how am I doing cho that choice? Apparently, I'm doing that choice in a reasonable way, because I'm, I'm seeing this flattening. I'm not paying for this additional complexity. Right? Now, I mean, in some sense, it's not so mysterious. You could, you could invent situations like this, but we don't really know what is actually performing this, this uh, what, what inductive principle is at, at work here. Um, all right, so just, uh, just a quick question. Yeah. yeah, don't worry. Yeah, well, yeah, so I mean, that's surely what's going on here. I mean, if we, if we wanted to get a plot like this, then we can't do it with D, or we can't do it with width. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's not the right notion. Um, and I guess, you know, th this is maybe the plot you naively make because at least, you know, in terms of ver certain as, a, as you are, I'm talking to you, but I know you know this. <laughs> uh, VC dimension, uh, like say, various complexity notions are going to be increasing as I move to the right here. So, so we have to account for uh, what, what, what is the right notion of complexity is very much, I think, how people are thinking about this question, right? All right, so let H 
hat be some uh, be the classifier learned by SGD running on my data set. Um, we're interested in the kind of distribution of the risk and the empirical risk simultaneously, and or we might reduce this to the, the so-called generalization error, their difference. And so people study this in statistical learning theory by, or one way they study is by proving theorems of the form, like no matter what the data distribution is, um, the, the, this, the difference between the risk and the empirical risk for this particular algorithm is bounded by some quantity. And uh, this, the, the bound that you prove, it might depend on the hypothesis space. It might take advantage of the number of data you have, the probability with which you want the bound to hold. Uh, it might depend on aspects of the data distribution, the data set, SGD, et cetera. Now, in some sense, you can, you, can, you can immediately get tautologies if you start depending on the data distribution. Uh, and so you cut sort of a stronger theory the less stuff you have in here. So if I can prove a bound uh, that only depends on, say, the hypothesis class that I'm searching over, the number of data, and the probability with which I want my uh, bound to hold, uh, that, that, that's like a, in some sense a stronger. If, if, this, if, this, uh, if, this, if this bound in some sense, whatever it means to explain, I'm going to basically punt on that question. But you know, if this were, say, tight, if, this, if I could get a tight bound, and, and numerically lining up with what was going on using only these three quantities, that would be a stronger, that would be a stronger explanation than relying upon all these additional quantities. So, so maybe the town bound would be like slightly tightened by increasing, putting lots of other stuff in. But if I can get a, if I can get a reasonable story only from these, that's a pretty good theory. Now, of course, it's not possible with these three. Basically, with these three alone, you're um, more or less stuck with um, uh, bounds of the kind of. Uh, that depend on the VC dimension of the hypothesis class you're searching over. And the, 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 the trouble here is that even in the first layer of, say, a very small um, neural network applied to, say, a very simple data set like MNIST, so you have 784 input dimensions. You have, say, 600 neural, uh, neurons in the first layer. So already you have 470,000 parameters in that first layer, never mind multiple layers. And that vastly exceeds already the number of data you have. Uh, and, and, I'm, and the number of parameters is relevant here because the VC dimension here is going to be essentially lower bounded by the number of parameters. Okay, so this, this, so I'm not, I cannot hope to get a, a bound that only depends on H, M, and D, or H, M, and delta. So what else do I need to put in there to, to get a, a, a bound that is tight, right? Um, and I'd like not to have to depend on the full data distribution because then I can get, I'll, I'll just be basically get, uh, arriving at a tautology. All right, so the, you know, the, so the, one of the main phenomenological kind of issues here is that you can you can prove bounds of, of some variety like this, um, and you can get some quantities over here which are very intuitive, and you can even you can even plot them and get things to line up. But like as a mathematical bound, you get situations like this. You get a bound, and maybe you plot this bound in terms of data. Now, of course, there's many other things feeding into this, right? There's data. There's some kind of property of the learning classifier, et cetera. But if you you know, if you look at this bound and kind of imagine how it might change with data, either fixing or having other some other kind of model for how the other in entries here are going to be aff affected. Like for example, if I change m, then probably h hat is going to change. Anyway, so it's complicated. But anyways, if I if I have this bound and it, and it drops below one at some point. Well, it better be the case that I'm in this regime. Otherwise, my bound is not really telling me anything as a bound. Now, maybe you can like stare at this and read some tea leaves into your, your bound, et cetera, and that's kind of the standard thing to do. Um, but if you, you know, if you were, say, aiming for the bound itself as a bound to bound your generalization error, for that bound to be kind of explain the full force, full kind of, kind of um, uh, weight of generalization that you see, uh, then if you're in this regime, if, if, this, if, th if this is the amount of data you're actually working with, then you're sort of you're, you're, you're out of luck, and you're, you're not going to be able to, to rely upon this bound to tell you anything uh, um, uh, directly. You'd have to do some kind of other analysis. All right, so, uh, so I said VC dimension doesn't explain things. Uh, in some sense, I think this is, was essentially or is considered a solved problem. So this is a paper that's 20 years old. It's by Peter saying, you know, and paper, Peter Bartlett and saying that the sample complexity of learning neural networks doesn't depend on the number of parameters, but on the size of the weights. So this is a paper that um, gave a bound on the generalization error, so a, you know, a theorem of this variety. But over here, rather than just depending on h, m, and delta, it depended also on the, say, the, some particular norm on the weights. Okay? And the idea basically is that that norm on the weights was sufficiently small relative to the number of data, then that would mean you'd be in this regime, right? And you'd have a, you'd have a bound. And, you, and people looked at the theorem and said, ah, okay, so it's the size of the weights that matters. I can have an infinite dimensional even neural network as long as I control my weights, I'm good. And that kind of made sense in that period because people were doing explicit regularization of the weights while training neural networks and like, ah, okay, 
Um, that, maybe that's why this is that's why this is working. I was I was I was we we were having to control the weights to get into generalization. And here I have a bound that says control the weights gives me a bound. Now, if you actually evaluate, you know, the bound that you get in this particular work, you find that this particular form that you get, you're, you're back in this regime. And so, as a bound, it is not not a theory that that is 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 not a is not a bound that's giving you say. That's explaining the the uh, on it on its own, explaining the generalization you see in practice. Um, but the asymptotic form was sort of seen as like, ah, okay, that smells right. Um, the, I'd say that, you know the modern incarn incarnation of this work is this line of work on norm-based capacity control, kind of uh, being carried out. Um, a lot of that work by um, Nisha Burr and, and Nadi Shrebro, and, and and this initial work was with uh, Ryota. Uh, um, so. In that work, they, they studied kind of like an ancestor of the, the, the norm that uh, Bartlett was looking at. The, uh, and for a two-layer network, this so-called L1 path norm has this particularly simple form. So you could, you could ask the question, like, does this explain generalization? Um, so that would be a, that would be a, a bound of, of this kind of variety. So I'm, I'm going to depend on H, M, delta, and this norm. And so you could say, OK, could this exp does this, is this bound going to explain generalization? We can go out, and you can train a neural network and see what happens to the path norm. This is actually a log plot over here. I'm sorry for the size of the font. This is a log plot here. And so this, the path norm is actually growing um, pretty fast. Now, it would be fine if the margin was growing fast, too. Margin is growing, but not nearly as fast. This is not a log plot. And so you see the bound become in immediately vacuous. Uh, so you can, you can say, OK, well, maybe it's too much to hope to characterize unregularized SGD in terms of path norm. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, slightly regularize the path norm. And you can do this in a variety of ways. We haven't exhausted them. But you, know, you have to really, really kink up the, crank up the regularization before you even get this bound to be less than vacuous. And by that point, you've, you, you, have, uh, you have significantly uh, Killed your performance, so your error was down here, you know, making a fraction, a tiny fraction of errors. But now you're way over regularizing, and yes, you're getting a, a bound now that's at 80 percent. That's not very good, but you've also killed your performance, right? And that's kind of what I see, what we've seen in practice when we, yeah. This is on MNIST even. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 30 percent is terrible, <laughs> terrible. I could look at the vectors myself and do better than 30 percent. So, all right. So, so, so there, I, you know, there's this idea that okay, there's some kind of implicit regularization or some other pr principle at play. I'll call it SGD is X, right? SGD is empirical risk minimization, or SGD is implicit re regularized loss minimization, or some kind of approximate Bayesian inference. And you know, and the, the thing we've been searching for is the other side of this puzzle. Or, or to figure out an X such that this puzzle completes. Like, what is an X such that, we, that SGD is kind of can be seen as doing X, and that X is actually strong enough on its own to imply generalization in a strong form, like basically yield give, give us a non-vacuous bound. Uh, and we basically struck out. We have not <laughs> we have not found an X. Where we have made progress is by changing SGD uh, by looking at um, noisier versions of the network. Uh, these noisier versions. Of on the network can be can be studied using pack-based bounds, which uh, kind of can be seen as a some sort of like a data-dependent compression. Um, people study compression, uh, com compressed networks, Sanjeev in particular, uh, and people following on that work. Um, but in terms of SG on itself, we're st we're st we still don't I still still not as far as I can tell aware of uh, a principle that on its own can yield say non vacuous generalization bounds. All right, so in the, in the context of this situation, uh, and us kind of looking for principles that would give us, uh, allow us to show, uh, uh, prove generalization bounds for SGD itself, which is like the long-term goal, um, um, there was this kind of work by Nagarajan and Coulter. And actually, this, the, the part that I kind of focus on is you know, I, I, like a, a smaller fraction of the paper. The bulk of the paper is maybe, it's, well, like half the paper is focused elsewhere. This is the second half of the paper. But to give this example where, uh, give it, this is their empirical example. They also have a kind of a very cute theoretical example, but I like this one better, and we built a kind of a th theoretical version of it. Um, they, they, have, they devise this little like, kind of learning scenario with stochastic rate in a sense such that the way that SGE behaves, the learned solution itself is not going to, is provably not going to depend to a class on which you can use the main tool that underlies almost all attempts to control the error, uh, control the generalization error of SGD. Okay, 
uh, and that tool is uniform conversion. So now the statement of, to formalize the statement of this is going to require a few steps, uh, but I'll get there eventually. Um, so let me explain to you the kind of learning problem that Nagarajan and Coulter kind of devised. This, so this is this is a, uh, uh, this is a little. They, so what they're going to do is they're going to design a data set. They're going to feed it to SGD, and then they're going to notice something about the way that SGD is behaving that's going to basically ruin your chance to apply most of your favorite tools directly to this to this problem. Though maybe there's a clever way around it, and that's kind of that's basically the puzzle here. All right, so. Here's the situation. So I'm going to describe the, data, the distribution of the data here. So the data, again, are going to be x, y pairs. So the labels are going to be chosen uh, at random. All right? And then the labels are going to determine uh, the x. And of course, you can flip that relationship around. You'll, and, and if this is a little bit, there's a picture coming up in a moment that might make this clear. But here's an, here's an initial way. So I'm going to choose the labels. Uh, half the labels are going to be 1s. Half of them are going to be 0. Um, now, the corresponding input for this, it's going to be, uh, it's going to start off as a vector that's uniformly distributed on this uh, high dimensional sphere. Okay? Um, and think about D like a thousand. All right? So, very high dimensional sphere. Uh, and then, if the label is one, then, then this, then this uh, point in this high dim <coughs> unit high dimensional sphere is going to be unmodified. But if it's, uh, a, if it's a zero label, I'm going to slightly expand its norm by 10%. Okay? So flipping this around, if you get a data point from this, from this uh, training set, it's either going to have norm 1 or norm 1.1. 1 .1. All right? And that's your job. If you, if you notice it has norm 1, it's a 1. It's a one. If it has norm 1.1, 1 .1, it's a 0. All right? that's, that's the situation. I don't think they added any noise to this at all, et cetera, but they generated a data set like this and they fed it to SGD on a kind of reasonably sized RAILU network. They fed it 50,000 examples. Dimensionality here is a thousand. Now, of course, you know it might look like you have a lot of data here relative to your dimensionality, but the number of dimension, number of directions in a thousand dimensions is exponential in dimensionality. So you're you're far fewer than number of directions in this space, right? So you're definitely not have, don't have enough examples to cover all the directions. All right. So this this, this is what fully connected. What is yeah, I think it's a fully connected feed forward Relu network. Uh, five maybe or three or something. You know, it's like a, yeah, it's it's a, I mean. It should be able to compute on all. Oh yeah, 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 and, and it does. It works. Okay, so it doesn't take too many doesn't take too many examples for it to learn basically the right thing, but and and so let me show you what this plots are. So the the way this plot is made is by picking two direction two two directions at random, okay, and then looking at the forming the hyperplane and looking at the slice of the decision boundary through that space. Right? I can't really summarize how this thing behaves on R to the 1,000, but let me take a random direction and let's hope that that's kind of typical. And what you see is, uh, indeed, it, th this decision boundary is between these two curves. This is a unit 1 curve, and here's a unit 1.1 curve. So it's in between these two, which is nice, because that means that, it, 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 for example, it got these two, point, it got these two points correct. I got, you know, I got, I got everything correct along this curve. In this, in this random subspace, it, 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 gets, it gets everything right. But if you look at the, uh, if you look at, if instead of picking two random directions, you look at directions in which it was trained, you see a defect, which is that where it saw a training data point, it, the, the decision boundary slightly goes inside the inner radius. Okay, and so it would have, if if I were to test it here, it would get it wrong. And it goes slightly beyond the inner sphere when it's given a posit when it's given a, a, a positive label. Okay, so it would get this point wrong, and that's you know and that's true. You know here here are two different here are two different slices of the training set: one with a, a negative and a positive, and two positives. And you see that this defect is sort of uh, present. The data is linearly separable. Yes, I think so. Yes, right. Yeah. You have to square it and sum it up, and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a high, higher dimensional space. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's e it's not a hard learning problem. Uh, it's you know. If I just learn a linear classifier. Yeah, it will so we'll kill it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So this is a trivial problem, right? But when we hand it to a neural network. The way SGD works, for some reason, it has these defects. Here, so it 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 on average it's getting the right thing. Indeed, the risk of this classifier and hello data is very low. You're, you're saying SGD is working. 
well, SGD is working on the average sense, but, has, but there, there is this observation. So consider this bijection. I have an input pair xy. I can take that input. I can take that pair x, y. I can, if it's a one, I'm going to flip the label, make it a zero, and I'm going to ex extend the input x. And if it's a zero, I'm going to flip the label and contract the vector. Okay? This is a measure-preserving transformation, and it's a bijection on this data set. And so, if I pass, if I sample a data set and I pass it through this function, I get a data set of equal dis equal distribution. You can't tell that I pass it through this map. Right? And so uh, what we see is, so def 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 define this sort of like a doppelganger data set or antipodal data set as prime, which is the map of my, data, my training data set through this measure preserving map, all right? Meaning I have training examples that are phi xi yi for i1 up to n. Here, based upon this defect, what I actually notice is that the, my empirical risk on the true data set might be small, but it is my, my empirical risk on this. S prime that's been passed through this, passed through this function is near, near one. So I almost get every single example wrong when I pass it through this map. And, and importantly, this, this, this data set that I've, con that I've concocted um, by transforming the training data set has the same distribution as the initial training data set. All right? Now, that might seem innocuous, but we can uh, so th this is a plot of that. So you, you see that you see as this thing runs, it very quickly gets very small error after uh, uh, after a kind of a reasonable amount of train data. Though I mean, again, this is an easy problem. We shouldn't be too impressed with the neural network. But its risk on this kind of uh, this transform data set is always bad. All right. Now, who ca who cares about this? Well, you basically, the argument basically establishes this fact that. If I have a learning algorithm A, and I, let's assume that we're kind of in this kind of interpolating regime where my empirical risk is going to be at basically zero with high probability, and let's assume there is this bijection phi that leaves my distribution invariant, and further, that this, this bijection does massive damage to my empirical risk. It turns my zero risk into basically risk one. Then you can turn that around, turn that around and say, all right, for every class G, now here classes are not, I don't mean a, a subclass of hypotheses, I mean, um, uh, choose, uh, choose among all possible data sets, all right? Because I'm, what, what I'm going to do is, uh, what, so what this is saying is that if I look at the risk and empirical risk difference of my algorithm, if I had handed it S prime, where S prime is choos, chosen from this class G, then, then this worst case generalization error is at least twice the probability I belong to that class. Namely, so the way to interpret this is if, uh, if, I wanted to find, if I wanted to define my hypothesis class in a super clever way, I'd say, okay, let's, be, let's say, let's only take the hypotheses that are possible to show up. So that would be, the, that would be, that would be equal to all the hypotheses A of the form AS prime, where S prime is a possible data set. Okay? So that would be, the, if I took all possible data sets, then, then this probability would be one. And then this would be two times one minus one, so this would be one, which would mean that my generalization error is, worst case generalization error is one. All right. And so you might be clever and say, or you might think, okay, well, okay, maybe if I throw away a few bad data sets, I'm going to recover uniform convergence. But if you say only throw away 1% of your data, if we only say throw away 1% of your bad data sets, then this is going to be 0.99. So this is going to be 0.995. And so you're still going to get basically vacuous generalization. All right. So basically, if you, if you give me a class of, if you give me a, and effectively, what you're saying is, if, if you give me a if you give me a class of hypotheses that contains the actual hypothesis that that SG learns with high probability, then that class will not have a small uniform bound on generalization error. I, I guess I'm confused about something like way more basic. Yeah, go ahead, Adam. We know that for like just standard epsilon delta learning. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so big difference here. I'm not trying to get. I'm not trying to explain worst case behavior here. I'm trying to get trying to explain behavior on this particular data set. So on this particular data set, it works well. So on this particular data set, the empirical risk is small and the risk is small. All right. And so I might I might want to get a, a bound on uniform convergence that is not about worst case, but is for this particular distribution. So I'm going to specialize my uniform convergence to be, first of all, spe specialized to the, the actual distribution I'm dealing with and the, act the 
and as small of a set of hypotheses as I possibly can hope for, which is like the, the hypotheses I might actually see, say, with high probability. Uh, both. Both. Oh, so then I missed it. So what was this bijection that left both invariants? Can you show it? Yeah. It's so this one right here. So I, I, I hand you a data point and a label. I flip the label, yeah. and I shrink or, or contract the vector, or expand or contract the vector. Right. It's just basically, it, it would change this data point to this data point. It would change this data point to one on the outside curve. Oh, so ra random, by ch random projections is going to tell me what is, it, what is a risk calculation going to look like. And this is the empirical risk calculation. So empirical risk calculation looks great, right? I got that one right. I got this one right. I got that one right. I got this one right. Risk calculation looks great, too. I got that one right. I got that one right. The, however, if I move to the kind of uh, um, um, adversarial data set obtained by passing it through here, then I get this one wrong, and I get this one wrong. In fact, I get everything wrong. <laughs> The whole, the, I, get, I get maximal empirical risk in the kind of uh, antipodal data set. So SG, the particular defect that SGD has, has here, yes, exactly. The boundary is slightly too narrow here and slightly too far out here. And the boundary is, is almost all of the boundary. Yes. The yeah, so actually, so, you know, a, a near measure one set of the boundary is good. It's just these particular points, but these particular points are not relevant to future, future draws from your distribution. So, anyways, so the main thing, and maybe we're just taking on faith at this point, that this particular defect, this style of defect, kills a uniform convergence bound for a class that contains your hypothesis with high probability. All right? And so what they conjectured in the paper is that in overparameterized deep networks, SGD is indeed finding a simple macroscopic description, but has these microscopic defects which, are kill, which may be killing attempts to so, get uniform convergence. So is this an applied data-dependent bounds? Uh, this is very data-dependent. Uh, it's it's distribution-dependent. It, this is distribution-dependent. Um, but like normal data dependence would be like, say, I'm going to depend on the margin. Right, and I would use some kind of union bound to like choose the right margin because I don't know beforehand. Now, if, if if you know, but in this particular situation, I get to you know, Oracle comes down and says, you're you're going to be 99% of the time or 98% of the time, you're going to be good if you say, look at you know margin eight, and this this will still kill this, right? So I'm allowed to have a. Any double negation. <laughs> what do you mean by uniform convergence? I guess I don't. Okay, that is trickier. And I'll have, to, I'll have to introduce some more machinery to state this precisely. Oh, but the, the, the theorem is this, that, that this thing is greater than this with, say, high probability. Uh, and where is phi in all this? And the probability is over this draw s. So where is the phi? The phi is, I don't need a phi. I, 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 the fact that this defect happens with high probability means that no matter what class g I choose, I, I'm basically, I'm, the existence of phi means I cannot means that I cannot I cannot find a class for which there is kind of tight uniform tight uniform bound. This is not about convergence. This is about it fails now. Existence of phi is an assumption. That's imperative. Yes, yes. In this particular case, you can also concoct situations where it's just there. G is a, no, it's a subclass of data sets, right? S prime is. Oh, you said. Yeah, cl class of data sets. But I want, I want my data set to fall into this class with kind of reasonable probability because I want to have a, I want to have a kind of, a, I want to have, let me just, I, I should have written down this. So he, here's, here's a, here's a, here are the only hypotheses that could show up with my algorithm. All right? That's all possible hypotheses that could show up, right? I'm allowing myself to choose a subset, and this is like specific. You know, I'll, I'll put a little star here. That's like, that is, these are the only hypotheses that could possibly show up. And I've thrown away potentially a lot of stuff. I'm, allowed, I'm allowing myself to choose a further subset of H, G. And, right, and then you know, my bound becomes less and less meaningful if the, if, if the particular hypothesis that I learn is, you know, if this probability is not large. Because then I'm not, I'm not actually getting a bound on my... That's the probability that the learned hypothesis is in this class. Because I want to say something like, with high probability, my hypothesis belongs to a class G. But G is a class of samples. Oh, OK, I've changed it, damn it. OK. 
Okay. Well, no, this, the, the H is not H. H is H is not in there. H not H star. Yep. Sorry. Okay. So the 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 the, the row map here is here. I have data sets, and here I have. So this is the this is a rubric. So if I choose all possible data sets, I should have said N. If I choose all possible data sets, I get this class H star. But I'm allowing myself to to choose a sub. Oh, z is the space that like z is the space uh, x cross y, right? So this is all all possible data sets of size n. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so the existence. So if I have say an interpolating classifier and there exists this bijection and the bijection does this kind of serious damage to my risk, then there's not going to be any any there's not going to be any interesting. Um, subclass of hypotheses um, with appreciable probability of actually containing my classifier, for which I have uniform, for which I have a small difference in my a small generalization error. So, you, like for, for so for in particular, here here's H, H star is all all classifiers that could show up. That's a big that's that's potentially a big class. This says you're going to have you're going to have vacuously large generalization error on that class. You might say, okay, well, maybe there's some bad apples in there. Let me throw those out and choose a subclass. One way you could choose a subclass is by choosing a subset of data sets and saying, okay, if, if let's say let's restrict myself to like a 99% probability set of data sets and then look at what hypotheses would then show up. But anyways, I can choose this subclass H not however I like. I've written the theorem this way, maybe I shouldn't have. But you choose any class H not, then the this if this probability of the hypothesis that you've learned blogging to this particular class you've chosen. If that probability is large, then, then, you, get a, then you get a vacuous bound, upper, lower bound. So in that, uh, when you uh, apply that bijection <coughs> on the previous examples, yeah. gradient descent still finds the same classifier with that? Oh, no, no, it won't. I'm not rerunning my data set on the Goppelganger thing. I'm just evaluating the, the classifier I learned on S on S prime. Oh, to, to, to fails, you flip the whole story around, and uh, and I have a data set S, and I'm and I'm going to think about running it on the doppelganger one. Yeah. So yeah, then what well, you said, yes. So the uniform Wait, convergence doesn't allow you to depend on the data. <coughs> the um, you, I'm showing my ignorance. Of no. So I mean, uniform convergence, uniform convergence is that this this supremum is. But it's not talking about convergence. Let's just talk about uniform bound. This is a uniform bound on all hypotheses in some class. What, but the class depends on the algorithm. Oh uh, yes, exactly. That's a lab. You, that, you nor, nor, I think people have this idea that if I were able to depend on the algorithm, on the distribution, on the blah blah blah, all this stuff, then this then this supremum would be small. But what this theorem is saying is no, it's not small it's when you have this defect. Here you allow yourself to choose a hypothesis class that does Yeah, go ahead. On the doppel on, on the doppelganger, yeah. Do you get the same? You you it will perform badly on S. Yeah. So if I t if I sample S, no, no, no. pass. Yeah. Well, let me let me, do, let me do it in a more complicated way because it implies both directions. If I get S and I pat and I get and I transform it to S prime. If I run SGD on S prime, it will mess up on S, and vice versa. No, no, no. S and S prime are not yeah, IID. Right. So they're, so you're testing they're, they're, on S. they're identically distributed, but they're not independent. Thank you. You're testing on S. You're training on S, and you're testing on S prime. Well, well, I mean, I'm not testing on S prime. Just the mere existence of S prime, defined by this bijection, ruins uniform convergence. I, S prime does not de determine my risk.
many people are pulling down their net, basically, right? Last few. Um, I, I think, I mean. This uniform conversion, well, what about their quality? Uh, no, I mean, I think, I, think, I think it is. I think it is. Um, because gen generally what people are doing is they're, they, they introduce some sort of notion of complexity, like a norm, and then they're considering uh, the class of all classifiers of, of some norm or less. No. So for example, you know, you have to be like, the, like our paper or some use paper, I think those. So Tangy paper is, sure, is definitely in this category, right? So he's looking at, he's looking at, if you're talking about the margin stuff, so, he, the, so, the, so the particular, cl the classifier has a, has a, a notion of uh, margin. Yes, but then you're not looking at the empirical press, which is the same as the risk of bound, you're looking at the margin empirical. Okay, is, yeah, so. It's not. These are bound as beta dependent, these are distribution dependent. I feel like that's morally the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, so if you want to move to them, so yeah, so one aspect of these margin bounds is you move to a, a surrogate loss, and now you're upper bounding it. However, in this particular situation, I believe the thing has large margin. So I could move to a margin loss, and I'm going to get this exact same um, defect. Because my classifier is going to have large margin, because my data, because my data points are very spread off, spread away from each other. So I, I can find a very smooth function that does what I've done here. Uh, yeah, it may, maybe even be worse. So the, I, the, the, uh, the story here is not so, t I mean, their particular development was tied to zero one loss, but I don't think that's so essential. You just need, you give me any loss with this kind of defect, then you can, the, the same kind of argument, which is just a few union bound kind of things, um, can turn that into a failure of uniform convergence for that, for that say, that surrogate loss. So I, I agree, like, yes, okay, so it's, you know, the margin stuff is moving to a different loss, so there's a data-dependent choice of what the even the margin, the, the Lipschitz constant is going to be. However, uh, there's a there's a distribution of what that margin constant is going to come in at, and so I'm allowed to choose. Say, I'm allowed to build a bound for, like, say, a, a particular choice of margin, which will show up, say, 70% of the time. And what this bound will say is that your risk is now at least, um, you know, uh, 60%. The worst case risk over your over your class for that margin loss. So let me let me let me press on because I don't get too stuck on. Really yeah, yeah. So okay, just just to recap. So you're saying you run SGD, you get a classifier. Its true population loss is small. Yes. It belongs to some class H. Well, many classes. Okay. Fine, whatever. Pick a class. Pick the biggest one, H. Or a nice one. Nice one. Okay. If I had chose if I had chosen a number of samples larger than the DC dimension of H, then the true population loss, which is small, yeah. would have to be close to the empirical yes. loss for all training. Yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So the reason how, why you're escaping this yes. is because we're not, we have some number of samples. We're not considering. Smaller than the yes, absolutely. Thank yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. I, I kind of, I, that's my world. We never have uh, more samples than the VC dimension. So, 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 so no, their examples always are have this flavor of what I would call high dimensional statistics, whereas n changes, the dimension changes. So they're not considering a problem of fixed dimensionality as the number of samples diverges, because then you're going to kind of trivially find yourself having uniform convergence for VC dimension reasons, right? I, I would just say there, you know, there are many examples where you know you could you could you could solve a learning problem, yeah, you know, by taking fewer than the number of samples. Yeah, absolutely. Right, but it's very, but specialized, right? If I could have, if you have a particular fixed algorithm in a class that has large VC dimension, I can design a distribution that's going to mess you up. Of course, we know that. You know, there are, if you make, there are plenty of cases where you, you make a very mild distributional assumption, and then you, yeah, suddenly, sure. You know, I can take very few samples. And sure. Then, you know, yeah. You know. Yeah. So this is, so this is, a, this is an empirical finding. This particular type of defect, and this particular type of defect will mean that at that sample size. Because this, this defect will disappear. Of course, I have too many samples. If I have a ton of samples, then I'm going to see I'm going to see both. I think I killed my. I'm going to see where do you go? I'm going to see both the top and the bottom, and then that will correct the neural network. Will eventually, have to deal with the fact that I'm seeing um, you know this and this right next to each other. So I'm not going to be able to have this defect and have small empirical risk. 
Now, of course, I'm going to need a lot of data before I start seeing data points and its kind of and its uh, and its projection onto the smaller sphere, or vice versa. That's a lot of data. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, definition. So a class, a class H has uh, a class of hypotheses has you know, has a kind of uniform convergence properties. It's like a simplistic version of it. If um, if for any epsilon and delta, you can tell me a number of samples M such that no matter what the distribution is, if you give me M samples, then with probability at least one minus delta, all the, the this this uh, this thing will be less than epsilon. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So actually, so in this particular case, I'm not even relying upon like the universal in the sense of any 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 distribution. I only care about uni uniformness. Yeah. This is this. Thank you. Sorry. There's two notions of uniform here. The, the one you know, one one uniformness is a supremum here. Another another notion is 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 a supremum over uh, the the data the data distribution outside. Uh, of course, failure of this particular one for this particular distribution implies failure for the whole for, for an arbitrary distribution as well. All right, so let me press on. Um, all right, so this, sorry, the state. <laughs> all right, well, that's good. It's good. So, 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 so that's Nagarajan and Coulter. All right, so this inspires us to think about ways around this obstruction. So this is some notation. I think the main thing that you need to focus on is okay. So this is all the standard machinery. I've, I've, I'm going to write z for my x y pairs. These are labeled examples. Um, here's my data set S, Z1 through Zn. I'm actually not going to use loss function. You can ignore that line. But I, I, I'm going to have to intro, like, spend a, a moment just saying I'm going I'm, I'm to have to move to randomized classifiers. Um, so this is, this is a space of probability distributions on H. And so now I need to ex extend my notion of risk. So I've, I, you, I've already introduced you a notion of risk for individual classifiers. Well, if I have a distribution Q, what I'm going to mean by a risk of Q is I'm just going to mean the average risk over draws from Q. So Q is a distribution on classifiers, and so I can think about the expected risk under that distribution. Um, once I give you a risk, that is going to define a notion of empirical risk. And... I think that's all I'll say for now. Okay, so, all right. So the, the basic idea, and this is like, and, you know, and and Vaishnav and Zico kind of uh, suggest this is a potential way forward already in their work, which is to uh, explain explain the generalization error of a hypothesis in terms of some other structure, uh, and so. This is a simple, this is a trivial theorem. It's not, you don't even really need to prove anything. But if I pick any sort of uh, other classifier, and I'm going to allow that classifier to be a randomized classifier, but it can be dependent on the data, so it can be, it can be coupled to your actual classifier, say HD. Um, then I can bound, say, um, this talk is going to be focused on, on kind of mean generalization error. I, I can write the mean generalization error as the difference in the risk with the actual classifier and the surrogate, the difference. Uh, the difference between the risk and empirical risk, that means the generalization error of the surrogate, and then the difference between the empirical risk of the surrogate and the original classifier. So they had this risk difference, generalization error, and empirical risk difference. And this is all equality, so I haven't really gained anything here. This is just kind of a change in perspective. Uh, and, I think, and then the potential place that uniform convergence can now appear is maybe H hat does not appear to a class for which you're having a very tight uniform bound on gen, uh, generalization error, but maybe if I move to a surrogate Q, that surrogate won't be too far in risk, won't be too far in empirical risk, and maybe it will depend. It will belong to a class for which there is, uh, uh, where, for which the uniform uniform convergence has happened, right? So H hat doesn't belong to a class that may, may not belong to a class for which uniform convergence is, but I can somehow simplify H hat to get to a, a surrogate Q, which is coupled to it, and Q could belong. That's the basic idea. H hat was yeah so I, so I um, H hat is my my learn classifier so like think about the output of SGD. So it doesn't have to be on empirical No 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 yeah this is this is totally general I mean th th there's nothing really to prove here this is just uh, linearity of <laughs> linearity of expectation all right uh, so an example of such 
a type of surrogate analysis is actually um, the kind of Bartlett and Phil Long, and I forget the last author, maybe someone knows it. Um, what's that? Ziegler? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, paper on benign overfitting. And so this high, like, overparameterized linear regression. All right, so the setting, the setting is uh, you have some design matrix, you have some labels which are uh, normally distributed. So this is linear regression. And you're going to perform, uh, 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 you're, going to, you're going to look at your uh, squared error uh, after you've, you're going to try to learn the, the, the hit, the uh, unknown uh, linear function that is describing the relationship between x uh, and y, or at least the conditional, uh, conditional expectation of y given x. Uh, and you're going to be penalize yourself with uh, squared error. All right, so by overparameterize, I mean that the number of uh, data points you have is fewer than the number of features. So your your your, your observation, your covariates in the side dimensional space. So 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 when d is less than, you're in this classical setting, and you have a kind of unique uh, le uh, least, uh, unique uh, empirical risk minimizer, which is its least squares, has a bunch of nice properties. When you have more dimensions than examples, then you, then you have not one ERM, but this entire affine space of empirical risk minimizers. And so you need some additional principle to choose among them. And you can certainly design things which are bad. <laughs> um, now, a re maybe the first thing you would try, and a reasonable thing, is to, instead of, um, you know, when this inverse does not exist, you can move to a pseudo inverse. And that corresponds to just like choosing, choosing among those linear predictors that achieve um, zero empirical risk, but subject um, among those, choosing that which has a minimum two norm. All right, so that's an inductive principle, and they, this was what was studied by uh, Bartlett all. All right, so they're studying. So this is a situation where uh, you know this is, I guess the situation wasn't that well studied. So they, they make a particular um, they make a particular decomposition of the of the risk of um, this this uh, pseudo inverse estimate base estimate this minimum two norm estimate. All right, this is what it is. I'm not going to go into details. But this decomposition is exactly a, a surrogate decomposition. It's, it's, it's saying, I'm going to understand the risk of beta hat in terms of the surrogate, which is I'm going to pretend that I fit to noiseless data. I'm going to pre uh, pretend that there, were, there was no noise. So if you pretend there's no noise and, and, and write, down the the, write down the risk decomposition and try to bound those, those particular terms uh, as they appear, like so a kind, kind of a triangle inequality on that particular risk decomposition, you get their analysis. All right. Um, um, which I'm sure they've internalized that, but it's not how their paper is written. Okay, that's one way to think about it. Um, and this is how, and, the, and those three terms that show up in the uh, in the, the the kind of surrogate analysis of the risk are de decomposes here. So this is a one-to-one -one map between these. All right. All right. So at least you know, so this surrogate analysis is not like you know, not something that people aren't doing. It's in some senses, what people are doing already. One nearest neighbor. The classical analysis of one nearest neighbor is also a surrogate analysis. Um, basically, yeah. Is beta has zero and beta hat have the same propositions? Uh, they, do n they do not have the same population risk. Okay, but it's small. Seven is uh, I guess, yeah, probably beta naught has smaller population risk. Yeah, uh, and you know, actually, I mean, their analysis might lump two of these two things together and, and bound them. So it might not be literally a, a, a kind of a bounding each of these individual terms. I think it might lump two of them together because they basically down to like a bias variance trade off, yeah. and so there can't be three things. There's going to be the two. I don't know. No, no, one of them is the like. Oh, this is fixed. The squared, yeah. Is an error that will be there even if you like put the true data. Yeah. So you actually, they end up they end up studying excess risk. That's your excess risk, so they subtract that off. So you get down to two terms, which end up being their so-called bias and variance. Uh, I see. So with risk regression, you prove the exact same thing. And you mean in terms of, in terms of a surrogate, or or you go through the ridge the ridge uh, solution as your surrogate. That, um, for risk regressions, you could prove the exact same result using uniform convergence. Ah, yes, Correct, right? yes, so yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And there's, yeah, and, and, I, and the, 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 this solution has the same defect. So maybe, maybe it's worth pointing that out. If I take my, if I take my data sets, um, my linear regression, and I added some kind of Gaussian noise, which pushed me up or pushed me down, right? So what I can do, my doppelganger, my measured preserving transformation can, can do, and this is a slightly more complicated, but you can do this. Rather than pushing the noise up, I'll flip the sign of the Gaussian and push it down. And now I fit exactly the wrong data set. I, I fit my noise going up, but actually my true, my true thing was, was down. Um, and so now your empirical risk goes way up on that. And that defect is uh, plugs in the same sort of idea, and you'll get bad uniform convergence for that class. The sign of the noise. So, like, I have a linear function. I, I, I have a linear function. Here's my, and I'm adding Gaussian noise. This is my true measurement. So, like, uh, like my particular data set, maybe this is my measurement. My doppelganger data set and my antipodal data set, I'm going to move that measurement down here and then interpolate. And that has going to have a very bad impact on my empirical risk, and that's going to lower bound my, 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 uniform, my uniform convergence or on that, uh, for any class that contains my linear interpolator. It's going to give this kind of too large lower bound, basically twice the noise. It's going to say I'm no, I'm no better than twice the noise, which is not BC. OK, it actually works pretty good. All right. Um, all right, so that's that decomposition. OK, so returning to the surrogate decomposition. So the basic idea is, OK, maybe we can regain some kind of connection with the uniform convergence by choosing a particular surrogate that will itself, where we can bound this particular term using a very crude t technique like uniform convergence. Right? That's the basic idea. Um, and uh, you know, here is maybe the argument we need to make. Okay, so that this 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 generalization error, which is signed, it's going to be bounded by the, the kind of uh, the, the modulus of the, uh, the expected modulus of this generalization error. And then I can bound this using kind of a simple argument to be: you, you pick any class you like. This is going to be bounded by the probability I don't fall into that class, bound, uh, plus the expected supremum over that class, right? Uh, so if I choose this class to be all possible all possible surrogates that can show up, then this will be zero, and I'll just have this term. But this is, this is, this is a uniform, that, you know, the control of a term like this is kind of, is what you talk about when you talk about, a, you know, a, a class having a uniform convergence property, Glavenko can tell you. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, that's a really subtle question. I think the the uh, the main issue that you have with compression techniques is that you have to prove that compression didn't change things too much. And that's very, very tricky. And like most most of the ways people prove that compression. Yeah. That's either an assumption or just tested on data. Oh. Uh, what I mean is, like for example. You, like a lot of these techniques that say, in some sense, move to a derandomization of the classifier, uh, or sorry, of the bound, will say rely upon the Lipschitz, Lipschitz, uh, Lipschitz uh, parameter of the learned function to um, argue that the risk doesn't change too much. So you end, end up getting a bound with the Lipschitz. Yeah, exactly. So that there, that so. Um, I guess you just pick, I guess you pick up dependence in that. If yeah. so, if you pick up a Lipschitz constant, you're basically from a you know from a perspective of a vacuous and non-vacuous bound, you're basically hosed because your Lipschitz constant is going to be very bad. So you have to you have to have something much more nuanced than. All bounds are vacuous right now. That's, a different that's yeah, yeah, but I mean, but the Lipschitz constant itself is particular. You know, Sorry? Lipschitz constants are problematic. Like, you know, start depending on Lipschitz constants of a, of your function. Anywhere, then that you know you're basically toast. No, it's not it's yeah, or you know, or if it's something more refined, sure. As far as I know, that's not a, that's not covered by this. Um, Anything like that. Also, can you say so? We should we should talk about this later. I think it is covered. I think I think I think that I think I think the I think the techniques that people are using. Are well, I don't know. It I have to look back at your noise stability. And what it depends on? Tangus, yeah. yeah, or or tangus. But that's a discussion for. Yeah. 
Yeah. So anyways, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you. But uh, yeah, and, 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 well, you know, if, you, if you can view what Sanjeev and others have done, Tengu have done, is like describe some kind of surrogate somehow, then potentially they can be showing uniform convergence on that. Um, all right, and so uh, and, and this is just like a different pr principle. So you could potentially bound the uh, the absolute value of the, the, the expected generalization error by say some kind of principle like mutual information between your data and your your learned weights. And there's various principles you might use. The, the, these these types of bounds are also subject. These are uniform convergence bounds under the hood as well. So th this is this is going to run into the same problem. In particular, the mutual information between the data and these classifiers I've been studying with these particular defects, you can show me the classifier, I can go look for the defects, and I can tell you what your data set was. That's bad for your mutual information. All right, so, the, all right, so, all right, so there's this idea of, uh, of the surrogate-based analysis, and here's one particular way of arriving at a surrogate. And the basic idea is uh, to perform conditioning. All right, so just a little bit of notation, unfortunately. So let's let psi be a, a random element in some space T. So this is a, what I mean by that is that this is a T-valued random variable, if you want. And I'll write the notation P of psi will be its distribution. All right, so P psi of A is the probability that psi falls into A. Um, now, when I have P superscript this F here of psi, that is meant to denote a conditional distribution of psi given some sigma field, all right? And this object here is a random element in the space of probability measures on T. So this, so I've already introduced random, random variables, random, sorry, uh, I've already introduced, introduced the space of distributions on the hypothesis space of randomized classifiers. And so this is potentially a way to construct a randomized classifier that is itself random, a lot of randoms. So, so I'm going to try to simplify this down a little bit, but here's like say, the, the key application of this. So if H hat is a learned classifier, which that means a random element in H, then the random measure, which is the conditional distribution of H hat given some sigma field a, F, call that Q, that is going to be a randomized classifier, and we can treat it as a surrogate. Q is a random measure. Random measure means it's a random element in the space of M1H. Okay, so there's a lot of randoms. All right. But you know, here's some, here's some intuition here. So here, let's consider a data set x1, y1 up to xn, yn. Uh, and think about the linear regression example that we just went through. Uh, so consider the sigma algebra where I remember only the x's. So I forget the labels. Or the I forget the responses. This is linear regression, right? So um, I, I was handed x's and y's. The y's were me me measurements of the linear function corrupted by additive Gaussian noise. And all, uh, all I'm going to remember is the inputs, x. All right, and I'm going to define my sigma algebra G here to be the sigma algebra generated by, uh, or sorry, and I'm also going to introduce this other sigma algebra, which is uh, the, the com complete sigma algebra, so I remember everything about my data set. And then I'll have this trivial, si trivial sigma algebra where I forget everything. All right, so these are the three possibilities. So QF remembers just the, is the conditional distribution of my learned classifier, having only remembered the inputs, X. This one remembers everything, and Q, uh, Q um, of uh, E remembers nothing. Okay, so what are these objects? So QG, where I've remembered everything, that is just that's equivalent to H hat. Since I've remembered everything, there's no randomness. There's nothing. To, there's not. There's no randomness to average over in my conditional distribution. And so I've actually Q is just QG is just actually a, another name for H hat. So surrogate analysis in terms of QG will not gain me anything. It'll just two of the terms will vanish because they're going to be equivalent. Because this is exact, this, this randomized classifier is actually just a deterministic classifier. Under the hood, it just runs H hat. So the, risk is, the risks are going to be the same. The empirical risks are going to be the same. I'm going to have the, I'm going to have the generalization error of H hat is equal to the generalization error of QG. I've, that's, a tr that's a triviality. It's just tau tau tautology. Um, I'm going to jump down to three. Q, Q um, E, where E is the empty, empty uh, sigma field, it forgets everything. So when you forget everything, the conditional distribution is just the distribution. So this is a randomized classifier, which throw, has thrown away all its data. So it's going to sample a fresh data set, run linear interpolation, and then, and then make a prediction based upon this fresh data set. So every single time I ask it, ask it for a, a label, it's going to hypothesize a fresh data set, fit it, and then make a prediction. All right? And so the empirical risk of that structure is just a risk. 
because when, when I handed a when I hand a particular data set, it doesn't use it. It it it, it, didn't, it doesn't actually depend on the data set anymore. It samples its own fresh data set, and then and well, sorry, the empirical risk is an estimate of the of the risk, but it's unbiased, right? There's no overfitting anymore. So those are the two extremes. But then in the middle, where I've just remembered the training data, what I'm going to do is, I, OK, so I have, my, I have my design. My design is fixed, x. But I'm going to resample my noise. So I'm going to corrupt my data set with fresh noise, interpolate that, and then make a prediction. All right? Now, that's maybe not a great, uh, maybe that's not a great uh, uh, surrogate to use, because on average, I'm going to be picking up um, 2 sigma squared on my empirical risk. But anyways, it, it's, it's, uh, it, has, it, has, it has kind of lost all the complexity. It, is, is, it has kind of removed all this information from at, uh, So the interpolating classifier has memorized all this information about S, like the particular noise. I've forgotten all that. All I've remembered is w where the Xs are. And so this, potential, this classifier is, is potentially a member of a uniformly converging class. All right. So one, one reason it's maybe useful to study surrogate classifiers that, are, that arise in this way by conditioning, so let Q be a conditional distribution of a learned classifier, is that the difference in risk on average is zero. So I immediately kill one of these terms. Uh, so now, now when I think about my, my surrogate risk decomposition, the generalization error of H hat can be written as the excess generalization error of Q, the surrogate, plus the generalization error of Q. So I've reduced, I've reduced my work down to bounding just these two terms. Now, if H hat is interpolating, so, so the expected risk is, uh, expected empirical risk is zero, then this all boils down to a risk bound, which says that my mean risk of my classifier is equal to how much additional risk I've, in, I've incurred by conditioning, because I've forgotten. I was interpolating, but now I've forgotten something about the data, and I'm rerunning my learning algorithm on a, on a data set that is some of the details have been filled in, filled back in. I've forgotten some details, and I filled them back in, and I run my learning algorithm. So I've forgotten. I've forgotten a little bit about my data set, so I'm no longer going to expect to interpolate. Because I was only able to interpolate because I was memorizing. But when I forget some details, I'm no longer going to interpolate. So this, this, this term is going to creep up. But the hope is that this term here will then come down. Now, of course, for this decomposition, it exactly comes down. This is an inequality. Right? And then potentially, I can, study, I can study this term by uniform convergence. All right. So. Um, so the two tautologies here are if I don't de-randomize at all, so that's if I re remember the whole data set. So I discussed that one. That was Q, G. So if I remember everything, then I, I get nothing. This term is 0, and I get, I get something is equal to itself. That's not interesting. If I forget everything, then this, then this, then, then this, term, this, term, is, um, then, uh, then this term is also, uh, then this term is 0, and I get and I, I flipped that around. Anyways, in these two tautological cases, you get nothing interesting. So you really only get something interesting when you're forgetting something about, not, not everything, but something about your data set. All right, so I, I'm going to, since I'm almost running out of time, I was gonna, uh, I'll, just, I'll try to summarize these these next few slides more quickly. So in the, in the Vaishnav uh, and Zico work, they talk about failure of uniform convergence, but as you were pointing out, Adam, if the number of samples diverge, then we wouldn't have a problem. In fact, every, every one of these classes they study is actually a, a class that has finite VC dimensions. So it's not a failure of uh, the kind of traditional notion of uniform convergence. It's something else, right? It depends on a particular scaling limit of the dimensionality of the problem and the number of data. So we've just kind of, kind of put that together in a notion of, uh, of uniform convergence specific to a distribution, so not universal in the sense that Samori was pointing out here. But for a specific sequence of probability spaces, we can talk about a, a sequence of hypothesis spaces as having this kind of uniform convergence property, this glavenko cantelli property. Right. So glavenko cantelli is the kind of verbiage in statistics. All right. So the, sh the short of it is that we build a, so this is a toy model just like the SGD example, right? You get data points, and if you move them to the out, from the outer sphere to the inner sphere, they, they, and you change their label, and you get the same distribution. So that's what I, we do here as well in this toy model. So we, just to simplify things a little bit, rather than, dimension, rather than vectors in R to the D, we have bit vectors that are at length 2D, right? And we're going to sample these, these bit vectors uniformly. So they're going like, kind to, of, by kind of a law of large numbers, or concentration argument, they're going to have roughly d zeros and ones, or equal zero, d's and zero, equal number of zeros and ones in these bit vectors. So they're going to be 
the, their norm is going to be pretty close to this um, level D here. And so the, the decision boundary is going to be exactly this D. It's going to be basically, OK, are you on, on one side or the other of this norm boundary? So that's our data set. So very, very similar to this SGD example where you're either on the outer hypersphere or on the slightly near inner hypersphere. So we basically just recreated this with bit vectors. Um, and just like before, there was a there's a measure preserving transformation which is going to do which is, which which can act on this set. Namely, now now with these bit vectors, the way to get a measure preserving transformation is to go from x to one minus x. So basically, flip all your ones to zeros and zeros to ones, and at the same time, flip your label. All right. So that's the underlying measure preserving transformation. And we'll, if we have an input x, then one minus x is its well called antipode. Um, well, th this is, uh, yeah, I'm not, well, let me show you what we got, and then, uh, yeah, I don't quite see as far as you're seeing, so um, let's talk about that a little bit later. All right, so the true labeling function, yes, if you're inside the, uh, the DL1 ball, then you're 1, if you're outside, you're 0, and most of the mass is going to be pretty near that boundary. All right, so the learn here's the learning out. It's kind of kind of ridiculous, but it captures. There's no real learning going on here, but it captures the basic defect, which is that okay, if this learning algorithm it has access to the data set, you hand me a new test point, and I'm going to say okay, is x is x in this data set? If it is, I'm going to get it right because I want to interpolate the data. I want to make no mistakes in my empirical risk. Um, however, if if it if its antipode is in the data set, then I'm going to guarantee I'm going to get you wrong. All right, so this learn this this learn learn classifier is going to get everything right except for if your antipode was in your data set. So it's going to have a defect at the antipode. All right, so that's what I've done. I've engineered this so it has a defect. All right, in particular, if the empirical risk of this classifier here is going to be zero, and the empirical risk of this this learn classifier on its antipodal data set is going to be almost one. All right, and so then by the same by the same argument, you get this failure that Vaishnav and Zico outlined. All right, but you can say some slightly more kind of uh, precise things using this high-dimensional glavenko Cantelli. So first of all, OK, so this thing is interpolating. So we've designed this learning algorithm that doesn't make any mistakes in the training data. It has uniformly small risk, because exponentially small risk, assuming that the, the distribution is large enough. Right? This, these bit vectors are big enough. Um, VC theory is not applicable. In this particular situation, the, the uh, um, uh, unless you have a kind of an exponentially large number of samples, you, you have a uh, you, the, 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 the VC dimension of the achievable class of hypotheses has uh, has vacuously large VC dimension. Um, but furthermore, you have this failure of high dimensional glavenko Cantelli. So, provided that your number of samples doesn't grow grows like sub exponentially in your in the, in the dimensionality of your space, or two to the dimension in your space, so th that's pretty mild. Um, the the the, uh, the loss class. So this thing is the the, the, the kind of the the the, uh, the generalization on the, on these functions is going to determine your risk. This this thing is not high dimensional glavenko Cantelli. So in particular, this expected supremum over the achievable hypotheses is going to be vacuously large. It's going to be almost one. So this, this we've constructed this to make it look just like their example, but we can prove things about it, right? Um, so let's let's de-randomize it. So the basic way that we're proposing to randomize it is let's just forget KD of the dimensions. We have 2D dimensions. We're going to forget 2 KD of them. And I, I, have to, I have to index K by D because I have a scaling. I have a, I have a, I have a sequence of le learning problems of increasing dimensionality. All right, so if you hand me a, a data point as 2D dimensions, so you hand me this, this, you hand me this uh, input, and I'm going to zero out the first uh, D of them, KD of them, sorry. All right? Now, what does it mean? And so I'll define my sigma algebra to be uh, all. I'm going to remember my. I'm going to remember only my kind of projected out data points. All right. So the, and then my surrogate will be defined as a conditional distribution of my learn classifier. This thing that has small risk and small empirical risk, but has this defect. I'm going to define my surrogate to be this conditional distribution of this. Now, what is the interpretation of this? Okay. So on input x, my surrogate. Resamples, or if you like, re-randomizes the first KD entries. It doesn't zero them out. By, zero, by, by this projection, by zeroing them out, forgets them. And so my surrogate is resampling the first KD entries from the actual distribution, and then running the original interpolating classifier on this this modified data set. 
Now, this modified data set has exactly the same distribution as the original data set. So, it, it, so the distribution has not changed. Right, but I get, a different I get a different classifier potentially every single time as I fill in these entries differently. And note, just to highlight, this surrogate is a randomized classifier. And so what you can show is, you can show that this, the empirical risk does not go up too much. Right, so I've forgotten some aspects of the data. So if, if I were to forget, if I were to forget too much, maybe my empirical risk would, would inflate quite a bit. But in fact, it's not the case. Um, if, uh, and actually, it is, it is possible to design surrogates to have worse empirical risk on average than the original one, somewhat paradoxically. We thought that wasn't possible, but it's possible. So the empirical risk of this um, is still remains small, the surrogate remains small. Importantly, the empirical risk on the antipodal data set is, remains very small, as long as you forget enough coordinates. And the risk of this thing remains small. All right, so that's all good. And indeed, what you can show is that, um, this, that the achievable set of surrogates, so the, so the set of all possible surrogates, that that class is high dimensional, Kovenko can tell you. So we, we, did not have, we did not have our original learning algorithm falling into this nice class, but this, this surrogate does fall into a nice class. And then you can prove a bound of this form using the risk decomposition, which says that the expected generalization error is going to be bounded by all this. And what this basically tells you is that I just need KD to grow faster than um, the log of the number of data points and the log of the dimension. So as long as I'm forgetting kind of a vanishingly small fraction of my coordinates in my surrogate, then, I, then, then this bound is going to be going to, uh, this is going to give me a bound that where the difference in these two goes to zero. So just here's a picture of this. So what's going on here? I have blue, red, and green, I believe. The blue, the, what's going on is I move this way as I'm increase, increasing the dimension. This has 16 dimensions, 64 and 256. What's going on with the different shapes is I'm, I'm increasing uh, the number of data Right? What you see is, I, uh, as for a sufficiently large number of distributions, this and kind of increasingly sharp transition from this particular de-randomization yields a vacuous bound to an extremely tight bound on the generalization error. Right? Now, just to point out, I can completely de-randomize the classifier, move to its distribution, and that thing is going to have the same risk as the original thing. So this, 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 there's always, at this, at this side here, I'm always going to have the exact right generalization error. And so this is really a proof technique that potentially suggests that if I can design a, a de-randomization, say via conditioning, that I have some handle on controlling the excess risk, the excess empirical risk, and potentially use crude tools like bounding the generalization error, then I can get a risk bound. Um, and I think there's an interesting scientific question, like which is, when does this transition happen here? So here I'm throwing away kind of a very small number of bits of information about my data set, and all of a sudden I'm ach achieving uniform convergence of the surrogate, right? I, I, it's not necessarily clear to me that you, you will see this transition, say, you, that you can get this transition to happen anywhere you like. That's not so obvious to me, or wh where these transitions can happen. Of course, this transition must eventually happen, because at the end here, I'm going to get, well, not, not this transition like this. Well, actually, yeah, so at the very, very end, I have uniform convergence trivially, because I have a singleton namely the distribution of my classifier that always has uniform convergence because it's a singleton class. So potentially, you know, the, so the question, when, when can this transition happen? This is a lot, a lot to be understood here. Um, and also, this problem has a double descent, double descent uh, kind of situation here. So, if you, um, so for, each of these, uh, for each of these lines, I have a fixed number of data, and I'm sweeping the number of dimensions. And what you see is uh, on the left-hand side, this is a bound implied by VC dimension. And here is the bound implied by the surrogate analysis. And so you get this up and down. So the surrogate algorithm is just throwing away some coordinates. It's, 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 it's uh, th throwing away, but then filling them back in with, with, with data from the exact right distribution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you don't have to throw away, you know, you could do something you could say you could you could add noise to your data and then condition on the noisy version of your data. And so what that would algorithm would do would it would look at the noisy version of your data and then try to sample from the right distribution to denoise it and then run your algorithm. Anyways, there's, anyways, there's a massive flexibility in here how you design your sigma al sigma algebra. Like it doesn't have to be just for getting for getting your data points. It can be you can you can design a larger probability space with additional random variables and condition on only some of these random variables. They don't even have to be random variables that appeared in your data. 
the surrogate's completely theoretical. You don't have to implement it. Uh, a good example of that would be if, like, every time you have to classify a test point, you completely revamp SD. So that could be one. Oh, you mean the trivial one where you throw away everything? No, like, uh, you keep your whole data set, but you could rerun SD. Oh, oh, oh. Right. Throw away your mini batch like choices. On everything but your mini batches. Right. Yes, yeah, so we haven't really talked much much about randomized learning algorithms, but yeah, you, you can you can not condition on the randomness internal to your learning algorithm, or you can condition on some of it. All right. So that 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 I'm sorry for going for the full time. Um, so. Uniform, uniform convergence can fail on every class containing a learned classifier with sufficient probability, and there's some caveats. I'd like to work out some, some of these caveats and whether you know this this kind of failure applies to, uh, say, compression style analyses or not, or what it says about those. A surrogate analysis allows us to potentially study uniform convergence on a smaller class, and conditioning is one way to obtain such surrogates. And so, just to, you know, so one of the things we're doing this semester is uh, studying some classical examples to see whether we can obtain kind of interesting classes on which uniform convergence is happening, and then build risk mounts through these classes. Um, and I also think that this particular technique of conditioning might be might open the avenue for empirical approaches to study um, these ideas in SGD. So. Uh, maybe later in the t semester when we actually do some work in that direction, we'll report on it. Cool. Thank you.